It just kind of goes to show authenticity rules the day when we're thinking about inclusion and belonging and getting people to identify, but also that more and more people are making decisions based upon who they're going to buy from and partner with and work with based upon values. So inclusion is a big value for people. So if you're leading with messaging that talks about who you're serving and what your mission is, and it aligns from a values-based standpoint, even if somebody doesn't necessarily identify with a specific group that you've called out, the values are aligned and they they definitely want to work with you too. And they're still welcomed, of course, with open arms. So I think that's great. And I think that's something that for people to learn from, that it's not always going to be, if I call out a specific group, I'm going to be automatically like pushing other people away. Yeah. And it's not really about calling out people. Just it, It's not like seeing people only for their race or ethnicity. It's about yeah. the shared experience. Yeah. So I could talk about my experience as an Asian American woman, but like that could relate to somebody who's not Asian American. Right. So I think it's really not about grouping people in like, you know, racial categories, but the things that are shared, whether it's, you know, the mother daughter relationship when mom comes from a different country. Right. It could be something like that. And that's a shared experience among a lot of first generation immigrants. One of the things that I am so grateful and proud of is that our community of small business PR heroes and people who are in our PR starter pack and our listeners and in our Facebook group is that we're really diverse and I really value inclusion and diversity as a core company value. Now, this episode is an episode that I recorded on my friend Sonia Thompson's marketing and inclusion podcast, where she asked me how I was able to cultivate such a diverse audience. You'll learn about how I view business, my core values, and how I live them and breathe them every day through my business, as well as a little bit about how I grew up to be the person that I am today. I want to give a little shout out to my friend Sonia for creating this space and also for changing championing diversity and including all people. That's really something that I try to do as well. And if you want to learn more about Sonia, head over to listen to her podcast called Marketing Inclusion. And Sonia Thompson is an inclusive brand coach, strategist. Uh, she has columns in Forbes. Uh, she has worked with big and small companies to see how they can bring and include more people and elevate their voices. So without further ado, here is my interview on her podcast. And the title of this episode is all about how to cultivate a diverse audience. I hope you enjoy it. Hey, Gloria, thanks so much for joining me today. How are you? Yeah, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. It's totally my pleasure. I mean, I'm really excited about this chat. So, um, but before we dig in, because we got a lot of cool things to cover today, let the people know who are you and what do you do? So my name is Gloria Chow, C-H-O-U. I live in Brooklyn where my East Coaster is at, but originally from LA. I am a small business PR coach with really no traditional PR experience. Started cold calling newsrooms, hacked it, and now I teach other founders how to do it. Uh, my audience is 95% women of color. I believe that we are literally shattering the status quo because we cannot make media representation more inclusive if we do not pitch ourselves and get seen. So that's really the ethos of why I do. 95% women of color, like I, that's a really high number, right? And you don't hear that too often. That's actually one of the reasons why I wanted to sit down with you. One, of course, I want to learn all the things about um, everything you know about PR. In terms of like how you attracted such a diverse customer base, because so many businesses struggle with how to do this. So is that something that was intentional, like an intentional decision, or you tried to make that happen? Or was it something that you looked up and was like, wow, I, you know, I've got this really diverse customer base. You know, I always grew up with a lot of people who are different from me, always was a very curious person. So I remember like one of my middle school research projects, it was like, do a research project on a religion, right? And I chose Islam and I learned so much about it. And I gave a presentation, like I went to the local mosque and I sat with the Imam. And so from a very young age, I was always very curious about people who are different from me. Mm -hmm. And I studied abroad in South Africa. Most people chose to go to Europe. So I was always choosing these things that like normally wouldn't be like the tr most obvious choice. Right. And so that's kind of who I am. I also grew up with a black family growing up. I lived in my best friend's family, a house from like all throughout high school. And okay. so I just think that the way I grew up was so different from the traditional mom and dad because I didn't really have a mom and dad okay. um, that I just never really conformed to anything. So maybe that 
it's just a projection of my energy, but I, I, it wasn't intentional, to be honest. I built my business. I had no copy or language around this being like, you know, advocacy work, which now I do feel like it is. But in the beginning, it honestly wasn't. And it just yeah. happened that way. Well, I think that um, like what you just described in terms of your network, um, and you might not even think of it as your network. It's just the people that you um, interact with, the people that you are drawn to and have in your life, in your world. But also it's layered on with that curiosity that I think helps people develop um in a degree of openness that enables them to attract and sort of um, connect with people who are different from them more easily than others. Yeah, maybe. I, I'm really lucky. I feel so grateful because that's not a problem that I have. But yeah, it wasn't an intentional thing. And only recently from from doing the work and really understanding my audience, have I realized like, oh my God, this is so much more than just PR and visibility. This is rewriting media representation, but that was a more recent change. It definitely wasn't that way for the first two years of my business. So have you noticed um, in terms of, like you said, rewriting media representation, is that something um, has, whenever you start out, cause you mentioned that like you started cold calling and, and pitching and all that kind of stuff. That was specifically for your business. Is that how that worked when you so were doing it? I used to be a US diplomat. So I was working abroad and then I was absolutely miserable, even though I had the picture perfect job with the pension and the retirement. And so I kind of moved back home and I restarted my career. And I always wanted to work in PR because I just am a natural people connector and I love to see people win. Um, and I applied for like a thousand jobs at PR agencies and they all turned me down because they wanted very cookie cutter agency experience. And I never worked at an agency. So my friend gave me my first PR gig where I got paid a couple hundred bucks to get them on like live TV. And I literally just started like cold calling because I didn't have any contacts. I never studied PR. I don't know any journalists. Googling broken links, throwing spaghetti on the wall. And just from cold calling New York Times, CNBC, FT, and just perfecting that cold pitch, um, I started coming up with my method that now I teach in my PR program. So that's really kind of the origin story. Very cool. Very cool. You said something um, in terms of like rewriting, I think it was rewriting the face of PR, right? Or, or um, And I'm curious because within a number of industries, you might have people say, oh, well, um, it's very, it's not di diverse, or there's a lot of industries that might be um, very homogeneous. And I think people just a lot of times accept that that's the way it is. Um, there's a lack of diversity in certain areas or perceived lack of diversity, but you are seeing a lack of diversity in PR overall, but you're like, we're going to change that. What was it about like, what made you think that this is something that we're going to change and address versus like, this is the way it is and I wish it was better? <laughs> well, I think through my own journey of understanding why I do what I do, I think in the beginning, right, as we build our businesses, it's really about like, you know, like the Simon Sinek thing. It's like, start with why. Yeah. We don't start with why. We start with like selling the features and the benefits. So for me, it was like, oh, you want to get PR because you want to get more sales and more customers. And that's kind of the very surface layer of it. But the more I dug into why my customers were the way they were, the, the fears and where they are, they're at and the generational stuff that they had and learning about their stories, like I really realized like they are mold breakers in and of themselves, right? And mm -hmm. so by doing this work, we all are doing something that's breaking the mold. And one of the things that comes up so often with this type of work is a feeling of not being worthy or feeling ready to tell our story, right? Feeling like someone else always says it better or my business is, is not legitimate. This is like feeling of like, you know, when am I really gonna be a legitimate business? And I think that's something that we all struggle with, especially as women of color. And so I noticed that a lot in my community. And so I quickly realized what I was doing was not so much just about the PR stuff, but more about giving them that confidence to yeah. really be the first. Because for a lot of these, for a lot of the, my customers and my PR students, they are the first, right? Whether it's the first person to um, go to college or the first person to speak English or the first person to come to the States, right? So that is really what we're doing. We're all pioneers together. Yeah. Since you have um, such this diverse audience who has um, a lot, like women of color in particular, are you able... Are you, do you find that you're having very specific conversations about 
different issues and challenges that women of color experience? Like, are you able to like have more, I guess, pointed and targeted conversations that are related to their lived experiences? Or do you keep it strictly as this is kind of my methodology? This is kind of how I approach it. There's, you know, in terms of from a PR standpoint, I think at the first iteration of my business, or should I say the first level of my business, it was very much, here's what PR is, it was very logical, right? And as I grew and scaled my business and you be and you formed a community and you really saw yourself as a leader in conversations, not just selling something, yeah. um, it became much, much deeper than that. Mm -hmm. So then the copy and, you know, I worked with my copywriter, Brittany McBean, and I really was able to uncover so many things. So that's going back to the mindset part, which is in order for them to, actually press the send button because everybody knows yeah. that organic PR is way better than ads. But the reason why they're not pressing the send button is because of all of these things, right? Whether yeah. it's generational, whether it's not wanting to like boast or brag about yourself, which I don't think PR is, but especially as an Asian American woman, you know, I'm not really taught to like advocate for myself and like, you know, very much like put your head down and say, yes, sir. So that's kind of how I grew up. And so maybe it's like seeing me breaking my own mold? Do they feel yeah. confident to maybe break theirs too? So I don't know, right. I think we're all doing this together. Yeah, I, I I love that you're able to bring so much of your own lived experiences. And even though the people who are in your program might not necessarily have the same experiences as you, the they can identify with similar sort of paths and um, experiences that are maybe adjacent or kind of like in the same realm that, um, that is helpful. So it's lovely that you're able to have those conversations. I'm curious that like a lot of times as marketers and brands, they think about, yes, I want to have a more diverse audience, but they might not necessarily be aware of what's required to serve that audience effectively. Um, because sometimes what is required to help people from certain communities achieve success is very different from what you might think of overall, right? In terms of the masses. W did you feel like you've had to prepare yourself in any additional way? Or was it more of because I've already got this curiosity and this um, strong foundation of a, a very a diverse network that I'm, I feel equipped to be able to support? Um, the different identities who are a part of your community? Well, I think the learning never ends. You know, although I have a lot of racial diversity, I also, you know, one time I got on the call with one of our students and it turns out that um, she had, um, she she was visually impaired and also hearing, hearing impaired. Okay. So I didn't realize that. And she told me that I needed to just be more mindful to turn on the captions, right? And just to understand that not everybody is going to learn the same way. And so that really opened my eyes to like other types of diversity too, yeah. like people who learn differently. And now I'm more aware of these things too. And I still have a long way to go, right? It's, it's also pronouns, right? That's something that I'm also like learning and, you know, um, navigating. So I think it, it never ends. It's just about being open to that. And I'm so grateful that I'm able to learn from so many people. Like I've learned so much from, you know, our friend Tarzan about like, and, and Kelly deals about uh, ableist language that I've used you know, in the past without even thinking about it. And so th those are the type of things that I now I'm aware of. And when I'm aware of it, I can do better. Yeah. So you mentioned that like you've started to call out specifically that you support um, women of color um, in your programs. And I'm curious, did that change the makeup of your programs even more so? Like, did it make it even more diverse or attract even a more diverse audience? And also did push people who don't identify as a woman of color away from you or like, you know, did it deter them at all? I actually don't find that it was less or more diverse, honestly, because okay. we still have non women of color join from time to time. And they mm -hmm. actually say they're like, Hey, I'm not a BIPOC founder, but your message resonates with me. I think that's the message of inclusion yeah. of um, understanding that somehow, you know, maybe you weren't always invited to the conversation and it doesn't necessarily always have to be, um, a ethnic or a color thing. It could be language, right? We have a lot of people right. who are immigrants to this country whose, whose first language is not English. So maybe they, they relate to that. So I, I wouldn't say it has, it's more or less, but I did notice that through my talking about my uh, relationship with my mother, I recently healed a lot of trauma with her. I think I've only lived eight years of my entire life with her. And I, okay. my father passed away when I was three. I am attracting more AAPI founders 
um, okay. because I think there's an interesting, interesting there too with being first generation immigrants from a country that you know has been historically so impoverished, right? I think there's a lot of things about money and scarcity. So we we are attracting more API founders because I think they do see the story about me talking with with my mom and kind of our generational gap. They see themselves in that. Yeah, it just kind of goes to show um, authenticity um, rules the day when we're thinking about inclusion um, and belonging and getting people to identify, but also that more and more people are making decisions um, based upon who they're going to buy from and partner with and work with based upon values. So, um, and inclusion is a big value for people. So if you're leading with messaging that talks about who you're serving and what your mission is, and it aligns from a values-based standpoint, even if somebody doesn't necessarily identify with a specific group that you've called out, the values are aligned and they they definitely want to work with you too. And they're still welcomed, of course, with open arms. So I think that's great. And I think that's something that for people to learn from, that it's not always going to be, if I call out a specific group, I'm going to be automatically like pushing other people away. Yeah. And it's not really about calling out people. Just It's not like seeing people only for their race or ethnicity. It's about yeah. the shared experience. Yeah. So I could talk about my experience as an Asian American woman, but like that could relate to somebody who's not Asian American, right? Could yeah. be. So I think it's really not about grouping people in like, you know, racial categories, but the things that are shared, whether it's, you know, the mother daughter relationship when yep. your mom comes from a different country, right? It's, it could be something like that. And that's a shared experience among a lot of first generation immigrants. Absolutely. Um, can you share, have there been any additional things that you've done specifically as you've been working with clients to make them feel like they belong with you, no matter what their type of background is? Mm, I think that for me, surrounding myself with other people who have the same values. So it's, so when I'm thinking about who I'm inviting to my podcast, yeah, maybe not going with the most obvious choice all the time, like the people who just happen to have the most hot following, yeah. but people who have something interesting to say, who might not have the biggest following, but have something else that we don't, we don't normally hear about, right? So that's how I am able to use my platform. Um, for example, one of our OG PR members, Dr. Greta Anderson, she is um, a woman in golf, a black woman in golf, and she started PR like in her 50s and 60s, right? And so like her breaking the mold in her own way, I'm able to elevate her story and together we're, we're rewriting the narrative, right? So just things like that and just being more, um, just being able to like ask people questions. So mm -hmm. everyone has different learning styles. So like I told you about one of our, one of our members who's um, hearing, who hearing impaired, she wanted me to put on captions. So now when I have my monthly calls, like I'm more cautious about that. And I want to make sure everything is like timestamped and transcribed. And there's in different ways that people can consume information. We have the audio only version for people who, you know, maybe visually are impaired. So just thinking about ways that I can give information and content in a way for, for all people. Yeah. You keep you keep saying this term and it's sticking with me, um, rewriting a narrative. I wrote um, something earlier this year, which is all about like inclusive marketing trends for 2023. And one of it was around rewriting narratives. And it was specifically about breaking stereotypes that exist for certain groups of people um, in different identities because, you know, there's a lot of negative stereotypes with different groups and the media um, and just a lot of the imagery, et cetera, that we see just kind of further perpetuates it. So I'm curious if you have any recommendations for, for brands with, um, for how they can go about rewriting existing narratives that exists based upon, you know, what you've been, what you do from a PR standpoint, as well as just what you've been doing overall in your business, because it sounds like it's probably a pretty uniform skill to just kind of think through this exists. We want to change that perception and this is how we're going to approach doing it. Well, I think the most basic one is having curiosity of just because something has been done before doesn't mean you can't question, like, is there a way we can do it maybe a little bit differently? 
you know, so, so that those are internal choices from the books that you read to the content you consume to the people yeah. that you naturally gravitate towards. Now, from an outer perspective, if you have a platform like a podcast or a blog or a newsletter, how can I highlight people, right, from different walks of life? So that's a conscious choice that you can do. That's literally giving them a platform. Yeah. So a lot of times, you know, as you, as you don't know, we're not going to name any names, but there's some big names out there in the online space. And they say, well, like DEI is so important to me. Like, you know, but then I, I'm scrolling through this person's feed and all of their besties, yeah. you know, they're all able bodied of a certain way of a certain. So, you know, I just think it's interesting because you can definitely tell yeah. like who you surround yourself and, and it's a, it's a reflection of you, right? It's a yeah. reflection of you. So people are taking notice and we all make choices. Um, so someone can say something, but talk is cheap. And there are, uh, there are definitely other ways that consumers are seeing where your values are. And it's, it's an imperfect journey. Like I went on a podcast talking about how I bought into toxic bro marketing and urgency and pressure tactics and how I really had to cleanse myself of that. And, and it's a journey that I've been on. Right. So it's not like you wake up and you're perfect, but as long as you're willing to do the work, and tell people that you are on this journey. I think you're inviting way more people in than saying, well, you know, I'm perfect and this matters to me. And, and then just like closing the door there without really examining like where your relationship to, whether it's white privilege or, or you know, white supremacy or sexism, whatever, like where your, where your proximity to, is to that. Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a great, a great thing for people to consider because it's not really about like a specific tactic. It requires a lot of, just overall internal work that will naturally sort of permeate into what you do as you show up in your business and you inter engage and interact and think about how to support um, the people that you serve. So uh, I love I love that that thought. Um, can you tell me about a brand um, that made you feel like you belonged? And you know what was your response to them? Um, as you kind of realize that, oh, like they, they really get me. Ooh, I mean, there's a lot, I think a lot of CPG brands are doing this now um, where they're putting different, different people of different walks of life, like on their imagery. But I will say growing up as an Asian American first generation, I didn't really see myself at all in media, whether it's advertising or any type of media. But I will say that when I went to Canada, when I was a diplomat, I went to Canada, I'll never forget when I arrived at the airport, the person who took my passport, she had a headscarf. I don't think I've ever seen anyone at TSA wear, wearing a headscarf, you know? Yeah, and so yeah. when I went to Canada, I saw how they not only had racial diversity, but there was a level of integration that we don't have in the U.S. I think in the U.S. Yeah. we're still very segregated. So um, that was just like, whoa. And then when I saw like all of their commercials and like the at the bus stops, it was people of all different races and, you know, queer. And it was just... Like it was very clear that there was a level yeah. of integration that it wasn't here. So, um, you know, I, I will say that that really stuck out to me. And I, I think we're getting better at it now. I think there's a lot of there's like, for example, like Marriott and like all of those hotels, like they're I think they're trying to be more inclusive. But I also think that there's a difference between really putting your, you know, money to your values and or just using performance allyship, right? Of like, oh, this is cool. So I'm going to have this one token black yeah. person in my photo, which we've yeah. all seen yeah. before too. So. Absolutely. No, I think I like, I, I notice that whenever I visit uh, other countries as well, in particular, like it, it feels like in a lot of instances, diversity is much more integrated and it feels less sort of like cookie cutter, but like a natural part because there's so many dimensions of diversity, right? So it's nice to see so many of them sort of um, intersecting, but also highlighted and present front and center um not intentionally but just like because of we're here like we exist and um so it's natural that we would be um integrated into society because you know that's where we are <laughs> yeah. um where can people find that you if they want to learn more about you and your work so I'm on all the socials at Gloria Chow PR. That's Gloria C H O U P R, and uh, I have a signature PR masterclass where I walk through it exactly word for word the framework of a pitch to get that hell yes from anyone, even if it's nice. the New York Times. You can watch that on demand at GloriaChowPR.com slash masterclass. And if you DM me the word pitch, I will give you a pitching freebie to help you land your next podcast. Very cool. Um, and any parting words of wisdom for brands who want to be intentional about building a diverse customer base? 
no one is perfect. I am still far from perfect. I still get checked all the time. But I think that if we just keep having our own conversations in our silos and we're never willing to maybe be curious about the ways that we can see things differently, we will never be truly integrated. We're just all going to keep having the same conversations in our bubbles. Yeah. So we must break the bubble. We must get proximate to different people. One of my favorite, favorite, uh, favorite authors and thought leaders is Brian Stevenson of the Equal Justice Initiative. And so they had like a movie about him, like Just Mercy. And he gave a talk at NYU Law School graduation where my friend was graduating. And he said something. He's like, he's like people, they like the key to progress, like racial progress is, you know, it's not about just like reading the books and, you know, consuming the content. It's getting proximate to people of a different lived experience. And it's hard in the U.S., right? The way that yeah. our neighborhoods are historically, it's like, so how, in what way are you getting proximate? In what ways are you going out of your daily routine to maybe like sit with someone who's a little bit different and just maybe ask a few questions? Yeah. And I think that's really the, the action part of it. Because you can think all you want, but unless you actually get proximate to people from different lived experiences, I don't think true progress can ever happen. Absolutely. I I feel like um, this happens to me a lot, especially thinking about even my husband, right? My husband is Argentine. Um, he's an immigrant here to the U.S., um, Spanish speaker. So just by connecting and being, you know, next to him, I see a lot of things I never would have considered or thought of um, as a result of, you know, uh, seeing things and as he goes through them and experiences the world here, right? Um, and the same thing whenever I'm in Argentina, seeing how um, I move through the world, how they think about things, it's quite different. And even thinking of my daughter, of course, who's mixed race, she has a completely different experience than I do. So I have to think about like her and kind of how she's still, she's young still, so it hasn't quite hit her yet, right? But like thinking about like even the things that she's gonna need to see because they're different from her, they're different from me, different from my husband, and just understanding that there are so many of us that have got a lot of differences. So how can we, like you said, get that proximity so that we can better understand each other so that we can better support and serve each other, right? So very good. Gloria, this has been such an insightful and chill and wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for shopping, stopping by and sharing your experiences with us. Thanks for being you. Oh, thank you. All right.